because he so this will be the first time I've I've uh, heard heard this preached and we'll turn to second Thessalonians chapter number three the book of second Thessalonians chapter number three please give me your attention don't be distracted by by phone kids uh, thoughts sometimes I do it myself I do it myself I sit and I listen to somebody preach and sometimes your mind will drift off you know while they're preaching and you think about tomorrow night try try to concentrate and listen uh, to everything it said here from the pulpit whether it's me or any, any whoever's up here and uh, the Lord sets a table there's something supernatural about people gathering together in his name and preaching the Bible that's his ordained plan and so it's not just it's not just me and you in here tonight he's here too so let's look at second Thessalonians chapter 3 and here here we go now I want you to listen to me carefully as I try to bring this truth to you and I I, I hope that uh, you'll get it tonight look at chapter number 3 verse number 1 finally brethren pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you and that we from him and other Christians may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith the word I want you to look at there in verse 2 Paul saying you pray for us that we would be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. Now we heard tons of preaching on wicked men. I'm tonight I'm going to talk about unreasonable men. Unreasonable men. Now, it, it'll be hard for you while I'm doing this not to think of old so and so or him or her and say, boy, I'm telling you, he's describing them up one side down there. Try not to do that and, uh, and and just listen to me. What does unreasonable, Paul said, pray for us that we'll be delivered from unreasonable men. What does that mean? What does it mean? Uh, okay, I mean, you know what it means with probably by not realizing it. Uh, unreasonable means beyond the limits of acceptable behavior or fairness. You listen to me? Beyond the limit. This is for everybody in here. The limits of acceptable behavior or fairness. Not governed by or acting to, uh, according to reason. So when somebody's unreasonable, they are not governed by or acting according to reason. What is reason? Uh, not being fair. Not being sensible or appropriate. Foolish. Illogical. Uh, you try and you try and you try to get along with that person and it, you keep having problems and keep having problems and keep having problems and you just seem like you cannot get along and finally you just shut your mouth and walk on eggshells around them because it's going to be a big blow up every time you're around them and because they become unreasonable I'm going to show you that in the Bible uh, it, uh, it, it's, like a, it's like a husband and wife I've, I've seen this many times a husband and wife are fighting over the kids. And maybe they're separating or maybe one of them's threatening to take a divorce. I've seen it over and over and over where a husband will come over and say, well, you going to let me take the kids to eat? Well, no, you don't deserve them. And they fight right in front of the kids. And he takes the kids and takes off. And then she don't bring them home. And then he puts them in, uh, in, in his apartment or wherever he's staying. And, and she calls him and says, Where's the kids? Says, I ain't bringing them home. You don't deserve to have them. And the kids are crying. I want to see mom. I'm on. And then they argue back and forth and back and forth. And he threatens to take them. I'll never let you see them again. Now let me ask you something. Uh, it's bad enough on kids when mom and daddy separate. But really, is that what's best for them kids? No, no. That's just somebody who's upset and full of the devil and being unreasonable. Uh, you know, the, you, when a man's right with God, you can sit down and reason with it. You know, you may not agree. You may not agree on stuff, but we can sit down and be reasonable. Let's talk about that for a little while this evening. It's like, it's like a parent who has a kid playing ball, and they're in a little game, you know, seven, eight, nine-year-old, football, basketball, uh, baseball, whatever it is, and the game's close, and the kid 
comes down there, and a kid from the other camp comes down with the ball. I use basketball here. And step like that, and she says, and the, and the mama jumps and says, he's out of bounds. He's out of bounds. You referee kicked. You see that? He's out of And the referee don't call it. And she gets so mad. She storms out on the court. I can't believe you let that go. I let you. I can't believe you didn't call it. I can't. You know them little, them little sports, them little kids in it would be fun if all the parents would shut up and have to stay home. That's who causes the problem. That's who gets kicked out. That's who gets in fights. It's usually the parents. Kids do fine most of the time. But anyway, that's the way they're going to be. We're just not going back. Going back. And and all because. That that kid stepped out of bounds, and a day or two later, sir, and says, "Miss so and so, yes." He says, uh, uh, "Are are you not going to let Johnny come back and play?" No, they can't get in the referee. Them referees are blind. They're cheating. Oh, now, now, miss, now, 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 we know he might have made a bad call. You see, referees are human like anybody else, and I feel like I feel like you may think I'm naive, but I feel like for the most part. And look at sports like that. They they call it like they see it. That don't mean they're going to get every call right. There's a strike right down the middle. Well, he's calling it like he sees it. And, and by the way, when you're playing a sport and the referee makes a call, you may not agree with it. He may not even be right. But he's in charge, so you got to go by it. That's the only way you can have any kind of organization. All these people want to fuss and fight and argue. I played ball with boys, and all they did was fuss and cuss and fight. I'll just leave. When it gets like that, I'm going to count me out. I don't want to. And she said, no, I'm not coming back. He said, ma'am, we need your son. He's a good athlete. No, we're not coming back. Now, she is being what? Unreasonable. Is that what's best for that kid? No. She's being a ridiculous mother. And she's, she's I'll never go back because she is convinced she's right. And maybe she was. And maybe she wasn't. But for the entire situation, you got to brain your head. It's best to say, okay, they'll make it. Look, a bad referee ain't going to make you lose a game. A crooked one will. See, when they're bad referees, it goes both ways. You get bad calls both ways. But if they're crooked, you got problems. And most of them in these little games, they don't get paid enough to be crooked. Uh, and, and there are some that, that throw it every once in a while. But I, you know, I've never heard one time the winning team complain about the refs. I've been, play, I've been playing ball since I was 12, 13 years old. I've never heard the winners complain about the refs. It's always the losers. If you're so good, win so much, the refs can't beat you. Play all seven of them if you're that good. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's, that's what I'm talking about tonight. The kid cries to go back. No! The coach invites him back. No! The other mother's call. No! That's being unreasonable now in court if you go to court i've been to court many times i've not been in court i mean i've been in to court but i've never been like tried with a crime or nothing like that i've never been a, 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 a accused of a crime or anything but uh I've, I've been to court with a lot of people put it that way and you know what they say in court and this way my my the lawyer mind works is you can convict a man of a crime and not have 100% proof. You don't have to say beyond a shadow of a doubt. You know what they call it? Beyond reasonable doubt. Right? Beyond reasonable doubt. If a judge and a jury decides a man is guilty beyond reasonable doubt, did you see it? No. Uh, uh, Jack Howell and some of them, I'm not knocking him right now, but some of them preachers, they got on this thing Years ago, and they started in their churches saying, if you didn't see it, it didn't happen. And that ain't right. That ain't right. If you find a man's fingerprints on the murder weapon and his DNA on the murder weapon and that person's blood on his clothes and that his tires tracks in their driveway and text on his phone saying, I'm going to come over and kill you. And I, I mean, after a while, it's beyond reasonable doubt you say, well, I, he didn't do it, he didn't do it. I know he didn't do it. That's unreasonable. See, you see what I'm saying? Y'all see what I'm saying? God gave us the ability to reason, to think things through. And, and that's, that's what I'd like to talk about tonight. Don't be unable or unwilling to be reasonable. Uh, my parents was wrong. My parents never did me right. 
Then I go to school. My teachers were not wrong. They never treated me right. Didn't get in trouble with the law. The cops was wrong. They, I didn't do nothing. And the judge wrong. You're, you're never guilty. Never guilty. It's always a, um, I, years ago, there's this whole movie, and you know, I, I watch movies. This has been 30 years ago, probably at least. Somebody taught me in watching part of that old movie, Mommy Dearest. And uh, that was old, what was that old woman's name? Joan, Joan Crawford, somebody like that. Oh, Lord, I couldn't sleep. I, I was, uh, that was horrible. I, I, and I didn't even watch all of it. But it's about this old mean woman, and she had a kid or a, a stepdaughter or a doctor child or something. I forgot what it was. And this little girl had to live with that witch. And, and she was like, I've had people tell me this. It, it, she was like this. She come in and says, where's my earring? Where's my earrings? I left them right there. You got them, didn't you? No, Mommy. Yes, you did. No, Mommy. Yes, you did. Say you did. No, Mommy. I didn't get them. And the kid's telling the truth. Yes, you did. Say you did. Oh, mommy, I did. Say it. You did. No, Mommy, I did. Say it. Oh, God, I'm about ready to commit suicide time I got through watching that. It was awful. I felt so sorry for that kid. I, 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 I mean, I, I, a woman, she's crazy. And that kid grew up saying, I had to admit that I did stuff I didn't even do. Just so she'd shut up and lay off of me. Oh, that's crazy. That's unreasonable. You have to give somebody the benefit. Maybe the kid is telling the truth. No, they're not. I know that. No, you don't either. All right. With that in mind, that's what I'm going to preach about tonight. I'm going to show you three men in the Bible where I believe this scripture would fit. Deliver us. Now, if you're married to one, all I can tell you is you can do what this one girl I'm going to show you here in the Bible done. She's done right so long God killed him. And, and uh, he might kill yours. I don't know. Uh, I, I, that's up to the Lord. He usually don't. So don't get your hopes up. You say, well, I'm married to a person. When's God going to kill him? He probably ain't never going to kill him. Uh, but uh, he might. He did it in the Bible. And I'll show you that tonight. The first man. Let's take here in Exodus chapter 5. This man's name is Pharaoh. Exodus chapter number 5. I'm going to show you a man in the Bible who uh, become unreasonable. He was the king over Egypt, and the Egyptians were his slaves, and he made their slaves make their own, make their own stuff and work. Probably, I, I guess those Egyptians probably were, I mean those Israelites probably worked an 80-hour week in Israel. Probably uh, 12 hours a day, 7 days a week. They didn't take off Saturday and Sunday. They had no respect for Sunday at all. And so more than likely, I'm sure they worked uh, uh, seven days a week. And uh, they made brick. And they made brick with mud and mud and straw. and made it to build stuff with. And Pharaoh got a little bit scared that they were going to take over. And look what he said in verse number four. Uh, Exodus chapter, um, well, uh, one. Just look after one right quickly. And verse seven. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. And there arose up this other king, this is, this is Pharaoh. And he said this, look at verse number 10. Come on, let us deal with, wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass, when they falleth out any war, that they vote us out. Basically, that's what he was saying. They join up with our enemies, and fight against us. We got control over them. We control these people. But they're having babies right and left. And if we don't do something with them, they're going to come up and overthrow us. We're going to lose our position of power. Now, a position of power may, was contributed to Pharaoh becoming unreasonable. Conv a position of power. Power, they say, uh, uh, total pi uh, power will make you totally corrupt. And we are. it's, it's the same thing now. Uh, Pharaoh does this. Pharaoh says, all right, you people got too much idle time on your hands. You start making bricks without straw. And they said, we can't make bricks without straw. Yes, you can. You make bricks without straw. Sir, we can't. We serve you every day. We live every, our lives seven days a week serving. Shut up. You make bricks without straw. And so they tried to make bricks without straw. And then they, they cried God was going to get them out. 
And you remember, uh, they said, uh, we can't do this. And Pharaoh said, I know what you're doing. You're too idle. Double your bricks. Double your work. He put double work on him. That was an employer who was scared of their power maybe overthrowing him or possibly voting him out. And so he, he said, uh, make bricks without, without double your bricks, double your bricks, double your bricks. Okay, Moses comes in, and here comes the plagues. One day Pharaoh wakes up, and they flies all over him, like that, and fighting them out like that, you know. And he asks Moses to pray. God gets rid of the flies, and he said, you going to let them go? No, I ain't let them go. Next day, there's frogs. There's frogs in the kitchen. There's frogs on the dining room table. There's frogs climbing up your britches legs. There's frogs when you step up, out of bed. Stepped up. There's frogs everywhere. And Pharaoh said, get them out of here. Get them out of here. Moses prayed and got them out of there. Here come the lice. Here come the bulls. Here come the... And, he, and you know what they said? Pharaoh wouldn't let them go. And wouldn't let, there's something about a crazy man when he gets in power. Do I need to say any more? There's something about a crazy man when he gets in power, he don't want to let go of it. Politicians have two goals. Number one, get elected. That's first, that's first goal. Number two, stay in power. And so Pharaoh says, no, you ain't going nowhere. And his men come and try to reason with him. And they say, look, Pharaoh, you remember this? They try to reason with Pharaoh. They say, look, Pharaoh, look, I know you don't want to let him go or nothing, but, but Egypt is destroyed. Our country, we're losing everything we've got. I don't care. I let, he's crazy. Woe unto the nation or the people or the company or the family that has a man like that in charge. Crazy. Crazy. Look, people. You know why they're letting all them illegal immigrants cross that border down there? It ain't because we love people and want to accept people and be good. Them. It ain't that. It's to bring them in to multiply and multiply and vote us, vote, keep them voted in to stay in power. It's putting them up in $500 a night motels in California. And, a, and, a, and people that we have that's retired, worked all their life, have to buy their own medicine with half of their welfare check. Now listen, I ain't, talk, I ain't preaching about that this, this evening, but Pharaoh was unreasonable. The frogs, the lice, the darkness. They come and say, look, Pharaoh, we're dead men. We're dead men. Uh, I'm not letting them go. I don't let them go. I'm not, now, if he had any sense, he said, you know what? You boys are right. We better, we better let these people out of here before God kills us. But he wouldn't do it. Most unreasonable people hold on and hold on and hold on until God finally kills them. Deliver us from them kind of people. You know, Paul didn't say, pray the Lord will open my door that I can get to witness them unreasonable men. He said, deliver me from them. Mm, that's bad, ain't it? Yes, sir. And finally, God got them out. The water came down, and Pharaoh drowned, went to hell. He died by drowning. Number two, take 1 Samuel chapter 18. There's three of these, and we'll go. 1 Samuel chapter number 18. And we'll look here this evening uh, uh, at 1 Samuel 18. And this man's name is Saul. Saul was another man in power. And he, he, he became unreasonable because of fear. Saul got very jealous. You know, jealousy will make a person unreasonable. If a husband is overly, insanely jealous, he'll make ridiculous, unreasonable demands on his wife. If a wife is, is overly, overly suspicious or jealous, They'll make unreasonable, make their mate's life miserable because of their unreasonable. Now, within reason, within normal reason, that, that, that you know, but you become unreasonable. And Saul did that because he was jealous of David. Let's look at uh, chapter 18. Now, we're doing a Bible study here now. Uh, look at uh, here. Now, David killed the giant in verse 17. Had a great, tremendous victory. Oh, Lord, everybody was happy. The Philistine got knocked in the head. Well, great victory in Israel. And they had a big worship service. And they all came out singing and dancing to meet the king in verse 6 with singing and dancing and music. And look at verse 7. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul had slain his thousands and David his ten thousand. So Saul said, uh. Now wait a minute. I like that little boy. 
He's good on his harp. And he did play one day, and the demon left. And he killed a giant. I give him credit, but wait a minute. We ain't going to have this. You're not going to sing that he killed thousands more than I did. I'm the big dog around here. I'm king over there. Nobody is going to be more worshipped and adored and idolized more than me. And look what he said. When them girls started bragging on David, Saul got full of the devil. And look here what he said. Verse 8, and Saul was very wroth. The saying displeased him. And he said, they've ascribed to David 10,000, to me they ascribe 1,000. What can he have more but the king? My goodness, might as well be king. And Saul eyed David from that day forward. He had it in for him. Don't get it. Don't get that. See, when you get like that, you get like that. Look here what he said. Let me show you a verse of scripture. Extremely interesting. Study on human nature. Look at verse number. Uh, and 10 came to pass on the morrow that evil spirit from God is on Saul. David played again, run the evil spirit out. He played, I've been to Calvary, and the evil spirit had to get out of there and leave him alone. And verse 11, Saul cast a javelin, for he said, I'll smite David to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. And David just behaved himself. Look at verse 14. Wisely, he prayed, God deliver me from that unreasonable man. And the Lord was with him. Wherefore Saul he behaved himself wisely. He was afraid of him. The more Saul tried to get David, the more God blessed David, and the better David acted. And it just drove him out of his mind. He took a javelin, like a, like a, little, uh, little, like a little knife blade, like that, and, went, whoosh, and threw it at him, and it hit the wall. He saved the whole kingdom, brother. He killed a giant. But Saul, was, was, that a, was that a normal, smart? No. He became unreasonable. Because be careful when somebody gets afraid or jealous or something, they become unreasonable. That that's not that's not normal normal thinking. David, you now you can read that whole story there, and David never did do Saul wrong. Never did. Right up until the end, as a matter of fact, he respected him. And and one time he had two chances to kill him when he was asleep and went in there, and he just cut off cut off part of his garment and like that, just so they'd know he had been there. And you'll say, look, you know, we've been there. And Saul walked up and they said, look, the son of, the, the son of Jesse's been here. He could have killed you. And Saul said, where's he at? Where's he at? Okay. It never dawned on that nut that David could have killed him, that his life was in God's hands. He couldn't see. He couldn't think straight because of his hatred and his jealousy toward David. People, you can't, live, you can't be a reasonable person when you hate somebody so much that you can't even think straight or you're so jealous to make reasonable decisions and actions by it. That's what Saul did. And he threw the javelin at him and threw the javelin at him. And I'll tell you, it got so bad. It got so bad that Saul said, I'm not even going to not support him. If you support him, I'll get you. Because Jonathan and David was just like that. That's Saul's son. They were his best friends. You know, he loved him as he loved his own soul. That love of David and Jonathan is one of the greatest friendship bonds in the Bible. Of two men that were really friends. I mean, them boys are stuck. Them boys loved each other. They'd fight for each other. And Jonathan was Saul's son. And Jonathan helped David. You remember talking to him? He said, now look, you go out there in the weeds, man, because daddy's mad. He's going to kill you. And he went to the dinner the next day. And he said, uh, where's the son of Jesse? And uh, Jonathan said, I... I don't know, you know, had some family reunion to go to or something like that. And he said, where's he at? And, you know, Jonathan went out there and he shot that arrow. You remember that? He shot that arrow out there. And that let David know it's bad news. And he got out of town. And I'm going to tell you something. You know what Saul did? The Bible said Saul threw the javelin at Jonathan. His own son. Saul was so unreasonable that he had killed his own son. For protecting a man he hated. Listen, that's what they try to make Hollywood movies after stuff like that right there. Them lifetime movies, all them are is copies of stories in the Bible, except cheap, dirty copies. It was real. He hated him so much. Now look, y'all. I mean, I've not liked people before, but I ain't never want to hurt one of my kids. If it's friends, 
Well, you say, well, what if your kids turned out to be friends with somebody you hate? It might dawn on me that I'm wrong. Amen. You know what Saul should have done? He should have called David and said, look, I'm sorry. I've been jealous of you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, let's get this right. You did kill a thousand. I killed him. You did kill you ten thousand, man. God blessed you on it. And it had been all right. But he died just like that first fellow did. Saul wound up suicide. The first man got uh, drowned in the, in, the, in the river. The second man kills himself. Never did get right. Never did get right. He repented, I don't know how many times. Never did get right. You know, Michael, that, uh, Michael, Michael that, that was David's wife. That's Saul's daughter. David was his son-in-law. His son was David's best friend. He married his daughter. And he's coming after him one time and killing him. And you know what she done? She said, I know daddy's coming over here. They say, well, ain't you loyal to your daddy? Yeah, I am. But you know, daddy's crazy. I feel sorry for kids that have to live with crazy daddy. You know daddy's crazy, right? Well, you should speak disrespectfully. I'm gone. I mean, I love him. He's my daddy, but he wants to kill my husband. So she takes and let David out the window and piles up a bunch of pillows in the bed like some of you used to do for your parents. Make it look like you hadn't snuck out the window. And she piles it up there like that right there. And Saul comes and says, where's David? Oh, he's sick in there in the bed. And she had against her own daddy. You know why? Because Michael knew he was crazy. Jonathan knew he was crazy. They all knew. He, now Saul wasn't, he was a brilliant man. But his jealousy and his fear of David made him unreasonable. David would have sat down with Saul and said, look, we'll change the lyrics. They can sing you got 10,000. I don't care. David would have. I believe he would have. Just to make peace. Do you know people, listen, there's some people you can't make peace with. You can try, you can try, you can try, and you can try. They can't, they're not able to think straight. They can't reason. Unreasonable men. And so, uh, it, it, he threw the javelin at, at what, what's his name, Jonathan. He, he died with a suicide. Number three. Third one, he died an untimely, awful death too. Same book. 1 Samuel 25. 1 Samuel 25. And we'll look here. This is a tremendous story in the Bible. This story by a man by the name of Nabal. And Nabal had a wife by the name of Abigail. And Abigail was a beautiful young woman. I don't know how young, but I'm assuming young 20-ish, 30-ish, somewhere along in that. But she's a beautiful woman. And her husband was a nut. How them nuts get them pretty girls, it's weird, to, it's hard to figure out. Ain't it? Them nuts know what to say, and them pretty girls are dumb enough to believe them. And uh, she married, married a nut. That's all there is to it. And all three of these people I'm preaching about tonight are men because a lot of times men are more to be just unreasonable. Sometimes it's a woman like that mama dearest thing, and woe be to the children that have to live with her. Woe be to the children. I'm talking about church people. I've known some. I ain't talking about nobody in here. I'm talking, I am know people that absolutely, they has all had it together at church, and as soon as they got home, they made their kids live in hell on earth. They wanted power, control, total power over them. I've known people like that. And I said, God deliver them poor kids. But anyway, Nabal, 1 Samuel 25. Now let's look at this story and I'll be through. Nabal, 1 Samuel 25, verse 2. And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel, and the man was very great. He had a lot of possessions. He had a business. He had, he had uh, money. He had 3,000 sheep, 1,000 goats. That was a rich man back in them days. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail, and she was the woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. So this woman could understand good. She could think clearly. She was very fair, and she's beautiful. Rare. Beautiful, black-haired woman that could think with good understanding. You say, well, hey, you know she wasn't blinded. Well, she was probably Jewish and she could think good. Uh, just kidding. Good. But the man was churlish in his evil and evil in his doing. And he was of the house of Caleb. So 
Here's Abigail, beautiful woman, smart, smart and beautiful. Huh, that's rare. Smart and beautiful. And she's married to this man, and he's crazy. His name, Nabal. And you know what the Bible said about him? The Bible said he was churlish. Raise your hand if you know what the word churlish means, please. Raise your hand. Anybody know what churlish means? One, two, maybe two people. Uh, it means um, mean, mean-spirited. A mean spirit. You ever seen somebody that's a mean-spirited person? Just mean. For no reason. Just mean. Hateful to everybody all the time. That's Nabal. And he had a drinking problem. And when he got drunk, it would make it worse. Usually when a man's a fool and then he gets alcohol in him, he's a double fool or a triple fool. And that makes it worse. And so Nabal had this drinking problem. And let me tell you this story right quick and, 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 and we'll go. So here's what it here's is. Look at down there at verse number uh, 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 seven. And now I've heard that thou hast shearers and thy shepherds, which were with us. We hurt them not. This is David sending a message to Nabal. Neither was there aught missing unto them, and all while they were in Carmel. He said, I took care of your men while they were here. Some of your men come around. We took care of them, fed them, gave them a place to sleep. And, and, and verse 9, David's young men came. They spake to Nabal according to all these words and ceased. And look what Nabal said in verse 10. And Nabal answered David's servant and said, Who is David? Who's the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays. There's the old saying, nowadays. There's a lot of that going on nowadays. See how that King James Bible runs our English language? There's a lot of people nowadays that break away every man from his master. Am I going to take my bread and water and flesh that I've killed my shears and give it to men that I don't even know? Get them out of here. Uh-oh. Hold your finger there. So here's the story. David has all these men. He's coming across the country. Some of Nabal's men come, and they're good to them, and help them out, and give them a place to sleep, and feed them. And some of them say, hey, tell your master we're coming over there, and we're going to need a few sheep, some help, and we're coming in peace. We don't want no trouble. We want to get along. Let's all get along. We don't want to fight. We don't. So his men go to him and say, Mr. Nabal, David and them coming over here, and they, they took good care of us, so they just want to know if they could come in here and uh, take some sheep, and we could, we could all be friends. He said, no. No, we ain't being friends. You tell him I'm coming. He comes over here, I'll cut his head off. You tell him. I like See that reaction right there? And when David heard that, he said, all right. But God, look here what David said. Verse 13, get your swords out, boys. That's the way he's going to act. You know, sitting down at a peace talk table, that'd be like trying to sit down with terrorists. And have peace talk. There are people that are stupid enough in America to think that our leaders ought to sit down with the leaders of Hamas and reach some peaceful agreement. You can't reason with them. They're unre- they aren't reasonable. They don't, they don't care or want to be reasonable. They could divide up the land somehow or another, give them somewhere to live, plenty of land for everybody. Most of the earth's not inhabited, no way. And, and everybody be fine. But he said, No, sir, no, sir. I don't know who you are. I ain't fooling with you. David said, okay, boys, get your swords on. And they go back and tell Abigail, said, look, you better tell your husband. Son. David's mad as fire. He heard about what he said. He's coming over here, and buddy, we're in trouble now. So Abigail, the Bible said this. I'm going to make tell this story short, so I want to read it off. Abigail didn't tell her husband and got together a bunch of sheep and a bunch of stuff. That woman went around and got, got, uh, got all kinds of gifts and stuff. She said, let's go, let's go, let's go. Don't tell him where I'm going to do it. Don't tell him where I'm going to do it. You say, well, I think her husband, the wife ought to tell her husband everything. She's saving that fool's life. I ain't going to get into it with you. But she said, don't tell him. He wouldn't let her go. She said, I've got to go. Come on, come on. She's doing the right thing. Went to David. Here comes David. And she said, my Lord, and fell down before him. And she said, please, my Lord, listen, my husband's crazy. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but he's, he's Nabal's his name and he's foolish. He's foolish. He's foolish. I, I don't know the times that I've seen that take place in churches where a good woman had to run around and protect that crazy nut husband of hers and talk to the bill collectors and go down to the courthouse and say, he's, he's really a good man. He was just in a bad mood. Please, he, he gets mad once in a while, but I know, I know he run over your mailbox and hit your dog and, and threatened to kill you and everything, but please, please, please. And she had enough sense Try to protect that nut. You can't. Let me show you what it said about Nabal. 
Look at here. Look at here. He's men, David's men said, Nabal's wife, there's good to us. Verse 15. They were walling up by, by day. All the while, while we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now, look at verse 17. Know therefore, know and consider what thou wilt do. For evil is determined against our master, Nabal, and against all his household. Look at this. For he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. Can't talk to him. Can't talk to him. Now, I know you're thinking about something right now. Can't talk to him. You say, well, don't you think we can go over and talk? You can't talk to him. I feel sorry for y'all. You have to live with somebody like that. And there's a lot of people to live with. These old mountain cougars all over these hills married to a good woman that wants to go to church and serve God and do right. You can't even talk to that fool. He knows everything. He knows the church is full of hypocrites. He knows everybody down there is full of the devil. He's right. Everybody, hey, the Bible, oh, I'm like, how silly. So you can't talk to him. You know what the Bible teaches us? You know, there's some people you can't talk to. I've run into a few. We see a man down here on visitation in Hickory, down on Ethan's route. And when that man comes to the door, I think, oh, Lord, here we go. I'd say, you've been going to church anywhere? And he proceeded to straighten us out on everything and tell us how wrong everybody was with him. And I, and I finally, I just walked up and said, well, I'll see you later, buddy. I, I, you, you can't talk to him. If you tried to talk, he'd talk over you. If you tried to reason with him, if, if you could show him plain, there's what the Bible says. Yeah, but I, I, I. It, they, people get crazy like that. And especially when he's drinking. You know, sometimes when a person gets drinking, it makes the problem like 50 times worse. So David said this. Go get him. Abigail comes with the ring. And she falls down before him and says, My Lord, please don't kill him. Please don't. He ain't got no sins. Please don't. Please don't. Please don't. And David said, All right. I appreciate that, sister. God bless you. You tell him if it wasn't for you, I'd come over. I'd kill every one of them tonight. So she go back home. He's drunk. Don't even know what happened. She saved his neck. I couldn't tell you the times I've seen that. I know a woman marrying her husband be laying in the ditch drunk and her and the kids in the summertime cut zoo vine all over the place and they'd sit out there with a flashlight and stuff all night so it wouldn't get snake bit. Him laying there passed out. There'd been a many a good woman went to church and said, pray for my husband. Pray for me. He's not that bad. He's not that bad. And usually it's that way. It's usually not the other way around. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is the woman that's crazy. I feel sorry for the man that has to live with a crazy woman. Doesn't reason. Nabal, don't you think maybe we could sit down and talk? No! But look, they're bigger, they're better. You know, he killed a giant, right? You understand? Bring him over here. I ain't giving him nothing. See, that kind of mentality. You know, you know, deliver us from them kind of people. God deliver us. He can't sit, sit down. Look, any two people can get along. They don't have to agree on everything, but any two people can sit down and agree if they're both reasonable. God deliver us from unreasonable men. Well, the rest of the story is a little bit, uh, he's drunk one night, and Abigail told him next morning when he woke up, the wine, had went, the Bible said the wine went out of him, sobered up. And she said, you know, David, you was a dead man, so David and him decided not to kill him. And his heart smote him, had a heart attack, and 10 days God killed him. And when David found out that, this ain't part of the story, but him and David, him and her started texting each other a lot. And next thing you know, he, he, they got married. He knew a good woman when he seen one. But, I mean, that's weird, but that's what happened. I'm just telling you what happened in the Bible. Things were different back then. And they, they wound up Nabal dead. The first man died, drowned. The second man died, suicide. The third man died, drunk. None of them lived a happy, long, peaceful life because they was unreasonable. Now I'm going to say this, I'm through. Don't you ever get to the place where nobody can tell you nothing. You get in trouble. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about you. Preachers get like that. 
Preachers get full of themselves and they dominate the church on it. They get where you can't tell them nothing. You can't sit down and reason with them. God help me. God help, forbid that I'd ever get like that. I hope if you tell me, Brother Danny, you're wrong about this and you can show me where I'm wrong, I hope I've got enough of God, enough sense to say, yeah, you know what? You're right. Let me tell you something, people. Nobody's right all the time. Nobody. I've known some people 20 years and I've never one time heard them say I was wrong. That's a dangerous path to head down, my friend. That's a dangerous... It's not going... Oh, like Donald Trump said, he never had to ask God to forgive him. That's the stupidest thing I've heard in my life. He needs God's forgiveness just like me and you or anybody else. does. That's a fool thing to say, buddy. That's a foolish thing to say. And... Of course, Job died. Don gets by and he believes to God. He says he does. But don't be a fool. Don't be fear and jealous. Don't be power hungry. I hope a hundred preachers hear this on the internet and get this. God deliver us from unreasonable men. I stand before pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this little lesson from the Word of God this evening. I pray, God, that Somehow we get it in our hearts and, and Lord, that we'd learn from this scripture and as Paul prayed, God deliver us from unreasonable and wicked men. Have you in our hearts this evening? Bless everybody as we go. Bless those watching from home and online. And God, help us not to be unreasonable. Lord, help us to have a balanced heart, mind and, and, be, uh, and be reasonable, not lose our temper and get mad and do stupid stuff and say stupid stuff. Lord, help us tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, all hearts clear. You're dismissed. God bless you. Have a good evening. Everybody be careful getting out of here.